we're recording. Welcome to the kickoff for this academic year's GW Biomedical Cross Disciplinary Seminar Series. The goal of this seminar series is to promote networking and collaboration in translational health among researchers, healthcare providers, and policymakers from different disciplines to shift the paradigm from seeking a cure to developing a strategy of prevention. This year's topic is cellular metabolism, for which the GW Office of Integrative Medicine Health has partnered with the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Medicine. A special thank you to Rong Lee, Chair of BMM, for his assistance with the planning, and to my co-chair, who I could not do this without, Brett Shook. To see the full lineup or watch the recording once they're available, you can visit our website, which we'll put in the chat shortly. And now for today's speaker, Jonas Cotrellis, MD, PhD, MDA, is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics, Emergency Medicine, and Genomics and Precision Medicine at the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences and the Associate Dean of MD Admissions. His work focuses on sepsis and other severe infections and the development of a comprehensive research program that includes novel diagnostic and therapeutic protocols. He utilizes AI-based cl clinical decision support sepsis screening platforms, wow, that's a lot of words, <laughs> combined with serum biomarkers and machine learning for early detection and treatment of pediatric sepsis to prevent se severe organ dysfunction and failure. Additionally, the use of extracellular vesicles has shown promising results in partially reversing metabolic and immune abnormalities. The goal of his research is to target the deleterious energetic failure and inflammatory tissue damage that occur under septic conditions so we can achieve improved clinical outcomes. Today, Dr. Catrillis will be presenting on the interaction between immunity and metabolism in disease, lessons learned from acute infection. Welcome and thank you, Jonas. Thank you so much, Lee, for the introduction and the invitation. <clears throat> I'm very excited um, to talk today uh, about the interaction uh, between immunity and metabolism in infectious diseases, and more specifically in acute infections um, and sepsis. The main challenge of studying metabolic pathways is their complexity to the, due to the vast number of metabolites, as we all know, um, the diverse chemical structures and the very sophisticated regulation of the enzymes that control them. Um, similarly, the immune system um, is very heterogeneous, um, a lot of cell types, subsets, and activation states, and context-specific interactions with the environment and other cells in the body. Therefore, having an integrative view is very important to understand uh, the metabolic control of cellular tissue and organismal homeostasis by driving into the intracellular metabolic network the interaction between cells and also the interaction between immune and metabolic tissues and the interplay between immune cells and diet. Um, cellular metabolism directly affects immune cell state and fate and is a major factor in severe infectious diseases, inflammation, but cancer and other conditions, of course. Um, those immunometabolic interactions mediate organism homeostasis and are very, very important. We'll, we'll talk more about this. From an immunological and metabolic perspective, the activation of innate and adaptive immunity can be broadly divided into four principal components. The inducers, which are signals that activate immune cells, the sensors or proteins that detect inducers, the mediators, which are proteins and metabolites that transduce the signals downstream of the sensors, and the effectors, which are metabolic um, effector responses that support the functional state of immune cells. As we can see here in this table, individual immune cells differentially utilize these components to achieve their desired functional outcome. Metabolism can have a direct effect on immune cells, such as macrophages. We're going to be talking about different immune cells today and how they're affected by metabolism. So we have two types of uh, macrophages that we're going to talk about. We have the classically activated macrophages or CAMPs that uh, produce inflammatory um, cytokines and antimicrobial uh, peptides critical for bacterial um, restriction. Recognition of IL-4, which is an, an, an interleukin, um, and it's produced during specific infections, activates macrophages to a very distinct state called alternative activation. So this is the second type of macrophages that we're gonna be talking about, the alternative, alternatively activated macrophages, 
or double AMs um, that upregulate tissue repair during infection. Classically activated, uh, activated macrophages shut down oxidative metabolism regulated by production of nitric oxide and a damage of the electron transport chain complexes. How respiration shutdown contributes to classical activation remains unknown. We don't really know how this happens, but some TCA cycle byproducts um, suppress inflammatory gene induction and have my antimicrobial um, activity. In graph two, alternatively, uh, alternatively activated macrophages increase oxidative metabolism fueled by the enhanced consumption and oxidation of multiple carbon substrates, including fatty acids, glucose, and glutamine. Such respiration targets IL-4 inducible genes. So as you can see, those two different types of macrophages have very, very different metabolic profiles. And that has a direct effect on um, their activation and, and how they function. So we can see here um, how mitochondrial metabolism may be differentially exploited for context-specific regulation of cellular activity, and more specifically, immune cell cellular activity. Metabolism can be affected by the availability of nutrients, of course, our diet, and the ability for energy production. Um, in settings of extreme nutrition, as you see in this chart, um, changes in immune cell populations, hormones, and cytokine levels lead to alterations in immune cell metabolism, which influence immune function. In obesity, there is increased risk of autoimmunity and protective immunity, unfortunately, seems to be in impaired. In the case of mal malnutrition, um, we still have an impaired protective immunity, but there is, it seems that there is some protection against autoimmunity. It is important to note here that immune cell populations are regulated by the availability of nutrients and the overall nutritional status. Another example um, that can help us understand the role of dietary nutrition and metabolism in immunity is through the examination of intestinal immunoglobulin A responses. Um, the, the nutritional conditions are an important factor in the control of immune metabolism and function, as we said. As you can see here in the graph, naive B cells have a high dependency on the TCA cycle for energy generation, and therefore depletion of dietary vitamin B1, an essential cofactor in the TCA cycle, results in decreased B cell numbers in the, the pyrus patches, which is lymphoid tissue, in the wall of the small intestine and a reduction of intentional IgA responses against oral vaccine antigens. By contrast, when there is availability of specific nutrients, for example, palmitic acid in diet, and that enhances the intentional IgA production through a direct effect either on IgA producing cells or through an indirect effect uh, by endogenous uh, sphingolipid metabolism. Now let's talk a little bit about how immunometabolism can play a significant role in disease. For example, we know that cancer is caused by multiple factors, both intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic factors can include dysregulation of immunity or metabolism. The extrinsic factors can be physical, chemical, biological, or environmental. Additionally, some infections by oncogenic viruses or bacterial infections can result in the development of cancer. Metabolism of complex molecules such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fat can provide the body with the necessary ATP, which is our energy coin, but can also lead to the production of metabolites that have many different functions. Some metabolites that we showed in the, in the previous slides um, directly modulate immune cells for clearance of pathogens can influence the physiology, the overall physiology of the host, which affects their response to an infectious process, but can also alter pathways that dysregulate immune cells with severe and deleterious effects and disease development. 
We will now examine the role of immunometabolism in infection and autoimmune inflammation. Metabolic adaptation occurs in, a, in, a, in, acute, in acute or chronic infection and autoimmunity associated inflammation. Here you can see the metabolic profiles, nutrient or metabolic regulators, and tissue or inflammation specific regulators that are responsible for metabolic reprogramming in human T cell populations. So we looked at um, B cells, we looked at macrophages, now we're, we're examining T cell populations. Um, blue cells display more catabolic metabolism, but red cells are more anabolic. In autoimmunity associated inflammation, blue red gradient uh, coloring here represents cells that display a mixed anabolic uh, catabolic picture. The idea though is the same. Metabolic profiles of immune cells are distinct and can alter their function and role in immune response, autoimmunity and pathophysiology of acute infection. Quiescent, long-lived T memory cells have discrete metabolic profiles from T effector cells, from, for example, with the former displaying a metabolic profile that favors oxidative phosphorylation over um, glycolysis, which is partly mediated by a CD28 dependent mi mitochondrial fusion. Circulating T memory cells um, take up lower amounts of certain lipids compared to T effector cells and rely more on glucose dependent fatty acid synthesis. In addition to infection, inflammation, as we, as we mentioned, also occurs in autoimmune disease, um, which is characterized by a dysregulated adaptive immune response. Impaired glycolysis is a very common characteristic of T cells in conditions, in autoimmune conditions, such as um, rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis, and, and of course, other autoimmune um, conditions. So how does metabolism affect viral infections? We talked a little bit about um, response to vaccines. We talked about T cells. How about viral infections? And of course, um, as we all know, COVID-19 um, you know, allowed us to study even more how um, specific viral infections can affect the immune response and how metabolism plays a role as well. So viruses such as hepatitis C virus and of course the, the you know, SARS um, coronavirus 2 that causes COVID-19 interact with entry metabolic factors to increase fatty acid synthesis, triglycerides and lipid droplets and essential for replication and trafficking of viruses to the cell membrane. So those viruses are using actually are, um, are using the, the metabolic pathways of the host organism to um, reproduce and replicate. Um, interactions, for example, between HIV and its entry metabolic factors trigger subscription of gly glycolytic genes and an increase in glucose uptake and glycolysis. Um, coronavirus um, COVID or COVID-19 uh, virus may also activate PPAR gamma. This is um, another major immunometabolism driver, and we'll talk about the PPARs a little more in detail, but um, it also induces lipogenic genes and, and actually increases metabolism. Um, Infection by viruses such as HIV, adenovirus, Zika virus, and human uh, cytomegalovirus increase glutamine uptake and glutaminolysis as well, which is the process by which glutamine is used to generate TCA cycle inter intermediates when pyruvate becomes limited. So this is another uh, metabolic pathway that can be used for energy production. And the way it works is glutamine is converted to glutamate and that is converted to um, alpha ketoglutarate, restoring the TCA cycle um, bioenergetic capacity. Now, having so many molecules um, to increase the, the TCA cycle capacity may also induce what we call a broken TCA cycle, which means um, that in that case, we have an accumulation of inflammatory metabolites. Um, so the accumulation of those metabolites, is actually harmful um, because um, it can increase glycolysis and provide substrates for viral replication and the worsening um, viral infection. 
why are we so concerned though about acute infections and sepsis? We talked about those viral infections, but why are we so concerned about it? Unfortunately, mortality from severe sepsis remains very high and exceeds most other major diseases. The number of deaths from severe sepsis and septic shock is similar to that from heart attacks. Uh, mortality is unacceptably high for both the adult and the pediatric population. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I'm studying the pediatric population, but, but sepsis is a huge problem um, in, in both adults and, and, and children. So chronic underlying conditions, genetic predisposition, and environmental factors have been implicated in the development of sepsis. And despite the fact that the scientific community has tried to develop new treatments for the past several years, we haven't been able to significantly decrease mortality. As I just mentioned, sepsis is a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. In a study that was actually published in Lancet in 2020, it was reported that 20% of deaths around the world are secondary to sepsis. So you can see one in five deaths, which is a huge number. Therefore, it remains an important public health issue that requires special attention. The mortality in sepsis is caused mainly by a multi-organ dysfunction, affected, affecting, as you can see um, in this graph, all major organs, including the brain, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, and the liver. Although in the past, this multi-organ failure was attributed to a hyperimmune response, we now believe that an imbalance of hyperinflammation and immune paralysis leads to organ dysfunction and clinical deterioration. So talking about immunometabolism and how important that can be, um, we now believe that the failure of current sepsis treatments may be attributed to the fact that changes in cell metabolic functions were not taken into account. Um, a lot of those treatments were targeting the immune, the immune system, but as we all know, this interaction is very, very important and just isolating the immune system and, and the immune response hasn't given us the, the, the results we hoped for. Um, the initial stage of septic shock, of severe sepsis and septic shock is characterized by hyperinflammatory state due to, due to the overexpression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This initial hyperinflammatory phase has been associated with energy deprivation or energy starvation. Um, that's how, how we also call it in animal models and can, can lead to direct organ damage and failure um, due to an increased metabolic demand that is already there in sepsis. As a result, there is a metabolic shift and glycolysis becomes the primary metabolic pathway for the body's energy production. Because oxidative phosphorylation is impaired, there's mitochondrial dysfunction and fatty acid oxidation is also compromised. So what happens in sepsis is similar to, had, to what has been described in cancer. So it seems that cells switch from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. Problem is, you know, um, it, oxidative phosphorylation is a very efficient way to produce energy and glycolysis isn't. Is a, it's a very fast way to produce energy, to produce energy, but it's not very efficient. And you can see that by the number of ATP molecules that are produced per uh, glucose molecule with oxidative phosphorylation, which is 36 compared to two, uh, only two um, ATP molecules per glucose molecule produced by glycolysis. I'm going to focus on two organs that are heavily affected in sepsis, the brain and the, and the lungs. Um, the brain is severely affected in sepsis, and the cerebellum is one of the most sensitive brain regions to inflammatory and hypoxic insults. We can see here that in sepsis, shown actually in, in, in graph two on your right, there's a significant um, degeneration of Purkinje neurons, the main efferent neurons of the cerebellum compared to controls that you see on graph A. As we discussed, severe infection and sepsis cause not only um, cause not only brain but also lung injury. Um, and patients with sepsis often require cardiorespiratory support, including mechanical ventilation, which it means intubation and respiratory support. Lungs are not only responsible, though, for the gas exchange, but are considered 
as a major immune organ used as a defense to pathogens inhaled during respiration. And the effects of sepsis on the lung are mediated by an immune imbalance that leads to a, an increase uh, in pulmonary vascular resistance and permeability um, with clinical manifestations of edema, but also to alterations in alveolar surfactant that compromises gas exchange, which is the major function of the lungs. Neutrophils release oxidants, proteases, leukotrienes, and other pro-inflammatory molecules um, such as platelet activating factor or PAF. Um, a number of anti-inflammatory mediators are also present. So you can see here how important the lungs are for gas exchange, but also for the immune response that is important during infection and sepsis. Mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs, there's a lot of discussion about um, stem cells. Um, they have been used in clinical, um, uh, in uh, animal models of sepsis with very good results. Um, this graph shows that mice that were made septic by CLP, um, which is sickle ligation and puncture, um, and treated with MSCs, had a significant decrease in inflammatory cytokines with levels actually similar to those of controls. It has been suggested that for this ben the beneficial, um, um, for the beneficial effects of the MSCs, partially responsible are their secreted extracellular vesicles or EVs. Um, the EV production includes three steps: the cytoplasmic membrane, inward budding from forms intracellular vesicles, which are also called endosomes. Those endosomes further develop to form multivesicular bodies or MVBs. And finally, MVBs fuse with the cytoplasmic membrane to release exosomes, which then can be incorporated into the recipient cells through phagocytosis or influence those recipient cells um, by signaling uh, with a ligand receptor um, interaction. Those extracellular vesicles are very, very important for cell communication. And, and by the way, you can find them everywhere. It's not just in a human body or in um, you know um, living organisms, but um, you can find them in 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 food, milk, and um, actually there are studies there where they isolate uh, extracellular vesicles from milk um, to use them for uh, for treatment of um, autoimmune conditions. Um, it's, it's a very fascinating field that it's now evolving. We didn't know a lot about uh, EVs, but for the past 20 years, um, th that th this area of research has exploded. So EVs, as we mentioned, are released by cells to facilitate cell-to-cell um, -cell communication in both physiological and pathological conditions. Those EVs contain specific proteins, microRNAs, lipids and metabolites that moderate signaling pathways in the recipient cells. The um, enrichment of a particular set of proteins or microRNAs within the EVs implies that there is a specific sort of mechanism that is responsible for that selective packaging of the cargo. But unfortunately, we don't know how this mechanism works and how it's decided or how it happens for specific proteins or microRNAs or metabolites to be packaged in, in those EVs and transferred to different cells. So there is a bi-directional community with those EVs. For example, the lungs um, might be sending EVs to the heart. You know, the heart is sending EVs back to the lungs and other organs. So this is a very complex communication that can lead to, um, to, to changes in pathways and specific pathways and the ones we're, you know, we're, we're examining are immune and metabolic pathways, um, which, is, which is really fascinating. Several studies have indicated that EVs can reach organs, all the organs that we're trying to study. This graph shows that when two different doses of MSC, which is the mesenchymal stem cell derived EVs were administered IV to mice, they were able to, to cross the blood-brain barrier. It seems that <clears throat> the measured concentration of EVs in the target organs is proportional to the initial dose <clears throat> that was administered um, IV. So what we're trying to show here is 
<clears throat> that um, the EVs are reaching actually the organs that we're trying to study, and they, they do have effects on those organs. For our studies, we use the sickle slurry mouse model of sepsis. In this model, we injected mice with sickle contents from donor mice intraperitoneally to cause polymicrobial sepsis. The first symptoms are usually present within two to four hours after um, the IP injections. And in order, it took us months to actually standardize the model because um, we had to trial different doses of sickle slurry um, with a target of making our mice severely septic at 16 to 18 hours post-injection and kind of resemble what happens in humans in acute sepsis as much as, uh, as possible. Because with lower doses, we found that mice were not getting sick and with higher doses, they would um, get very sick and, and um, would need to be euthanized very early. That was not very optimal to study acute infection and sepsis that in the human body um, happens very acutely, but of course it doesn't you know, um, happen within two or three or four hours, it takes some time. So with this model that we have developed, we're able to resemble what um, happens with acute infections in humans. So we had four different groups, two septic and two control non-septic groups. Um, septic mice received either mesenchymal stem cell derived EVs or media, and control mice, the same thing. They received um, either EVs or media um, for those experiments. We use a validated sepsis scoring system to clinically assess mice after injections. This, the, this scoring system um, includes seven different parameters. Appearance, level of consciousness, activity, response to stimuli, respiratory rate, respiratory quality, and eye appearance. Uh, maximum score for each parameter is four, and maximum total score can be 28. A higher score indicates a worsened condition compared to baseline. So those with higher scores meant that they were sicker than, um, than um, other mice. And they were sacrificed if they reached a score of 15 or higher. For example, just for you to understand what it means to have a score of 15, mice usually without score were stationary in, in their cage, would have pyloerection, and would not respond to auditory stimuli, but could have a slight response to touch. They look pretty sick. I have to, I have to tell you, after a few hours, um, we, we have validated um, the model, but also this, this, this sepsis scoring system has worked um, really well for us. So what happened after we treated our mice with EVs? What are some clinical outcomes? And the most important outcome is what happened when we used the, the, the scoring uh, system, what happened to those scores? As you can see, a baseline, which is at the time we injected our mice with EVs or media, these are septic mice, both group have similar scores. This is important for our analysis as we wanted a baseline both groups to include mice of similar severity. Interestingly though, at sacrifice, the treated group had a lower average overall score compared to the non-treated group, which means clinical improvement. In order also to capture some improvements after treatment that would skew our results, if only scores that sacrificed were used, we also assessed the highest score for each mouse. We again found that the average peak score in the treatment in the treatment group was lower than that of the control group, which means that clinically the the improvement is there. We saw a clinical improvement um, in those mice that we treated with um, mesenchymal stem cell derived extracellular vesicles. In terms of inflammation, treatment of septic mice with EVs led to the decrease of the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. IL-6 and TNF-alpha close to the control levels. TNF-alpha, which was staying here red, pink, um, is mainly expressed in the Purkinje neurons, um, whereas um, IL-6, which is purple, is diffusely expressed um, in the internal um, granule layer. Remember that IL-6 has been implicated in the pathophysiology of many infections, including COVID-19, um, Remember that cytokine storm that we were talking about in, in COVID-19, as well as other um, immune and autoimmune conditions. 
Um, it has also been used as a biomarker for severity or relapse um, of, of the disease. And anti-IL-6 antibodies have been developed for use in diseases that are caused by immune dysregulation. There are studies with anti-IL-6 antibodies. As we said, the IL-6 is implicated in many different uh, immune conditions. So when comparing the differentially expressed genes in RNA sequencing of septic EV treated and non-treated cerebella, uh, 103 down-regulated and 119 up-regulated genes were identified in the cerebella of EV treated mice with sepsis as compared to the non-treated group. Using the Ingenuity Pathway Analysis software, we found that the neuroinflammatory pathways remained activated in treated mice while for example, the IL-6 um, pro-inflammatory signaling pathway, we just talked about IL-6, was inhibited. As a reminder, we're not expecting, and, and, and that's um, when we have these new definitions of sepsis and understanding of the pathophysiology, we're not expecting when we treated treating sepsis, and that's why a lot of sepsis and severe infection treatments failed, we're not expecting not to have an immune response or completely stop the immune response. You need, your body needs to have an immune response to fight off the infection. In addition, of course, to the immune pathways, which is not surprising, we found that metabolic signaling pathways that promote energy production, ATP, our energy coin, um, including the PI3K, AKT, IGF-1, AMPK, and the PPARs, I remember PPAR gamma that we talked about um, before, PPAR alpha here um, was predicted to be activated, suggesting that there was an improvement in energy production um, with treatment. And of course, as we understand, um, and I'm not showing it here, but there was a sepsis related decreased energy production. Those pathways were um, predicted to be inhibited in, um, in septic mice that did not receive treatment. To further assess the effects of our treatment to metabolism in sepsis, we use the seahorse technology to measure oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis in the cerebellum. And I know in this series, there might be uh, more um, researchers talking about the, the seahorse. Um, it's a great new technology that's been out there for the past few years, and it has been very helpful for us to kind of um, identify energetic pathways and um, see whether oxidative phosphorylation is, um, is um, um, not properly functioning and there is mitochondrial dysfunction. So what does the Seahorse uh, device do? It measures oxygen consumption rate or OCAR, an extracellular acidification rate or ECAR. OCAR is an indicator of mitochondrial respiration and ECAR is largely the result of gl glycolysis. So OCAR is our oxidative phosphorylation, ECAR is our glycolysis. The, the, this assay actually uh, measures basal respiration, ATP-linked respiration, maximal respiration, spare respiratory capacity, and non-mitochondrial respiration using modulators of cellular respiration. And we'll talk about what those um, mean in a, in a few minutes. This protocol involves three serial injections of oligomycin, FCCP, and rotenone antimycin A. Oligomycin, the first drug that we use, um, and actually there's a, there's a plate that we use in the seahorse and the device automatically injects uh, sequentially those three um, different drugs. Um, and, and I'm gonna be talking about what each one of those does to see how we study um, the cycle and how do we, how we know, how we measure oxidative phosphorylation glycolysis. So the first drug that's injected is called oligomycin. And what it does, it inhibits ATP synthase, which is complex five, and results in a reduction in mitochondrial respiration or OCAR. This decrease in OCAR is linked to cellular ATP production. So, so this is directly linked to the ATP production. The second injection, which is with FCCP, um, it actually, what it does, it collapses the, the, the proton gradient and disrupts the mitochondrial membrane potential. As a result, the electron flow through the electron transport chain is uninhibited and oxygen consumption by complex four re reaches the maximum. And that's how we measure um, the, um, the maximal respiration. 
the um, FCCP stimulated ochre can then be used to calculate um, spare respiratory capacity defined as the difference between maximal respiration and basal respiration, which is the baseline. Um, the, um, the spare re respiratory capacity is a measure of the ability of the cell to respond to increased energy demand or under stress. The third injection is a mixture of rotenone, a, a complex one inhibitor, and antimycin A and complex three inhibitor. What it does is this combination, it shuts down mitochondrial respiration and enables the calculation of non-mitochondrial respiration. So what are the other pathways that the cell is using to produce energy now that you can't use, uh, that now that it can't use not um, mitochondrial respiration? Um, by the way, what you see here on your right, this is not our data. This is an example of how seahorse data looks like. In our seahorse um, data. So as you can see here, um, and, and by the way, I'm going to mention again that basal respiration is the measurement of the cell's relative um, utilization of mitochondrial respiration and glycolysis under resting conditions, okay? And maximal respiration is the relative utilization of mitochondrial respiration and glycolysis when those cells are stressed. As you can see here, treatment with our extracellular vesicles increased both basal and maximal respiration in the septic cerebellum, indicating and you know that there is an improvement in mitochondrial function. EVs also restored the energetic potential of the cerebellum of septic mice, which is a measurement of the cell's ability to respond to an energetic demand, and it's an in, which is important in, in sepsis, as we mentioned. It is an indicator of cell fitness or flexibility. We observed an improvement in both oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis, which is important in sepsis considering the increased organ energetic uh, needs. This positive effect on metabolism could partially explain the clinical improvement of treated mice. Of course, as we said, there are a lot of interactions um, that come to play. So it's not just metabolism, but we, we, um, we think that because we have um, our energy production is restored um, to pretty high levels, and there's there's a significant improvement in ATP production that that can explain some of the um, very positive effects that we see from our treatment in the clinical picture. Going back to the lungs, in order to study the effects of sepsis on lung immunity and metabolism, we use the same exact experimental model that we've discussed before. Um, lung tissue was harvested and immune cells were studying using flow cytometry. We also extracted RNA from lung tissue and performed the RNA sequencing. Then we used um, the software that I mentioned, it's called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis or IPA. Many of you might be familiar with that uh, to, um, to I'd um, examine differentially expressed mRNA. Um, here you can see uh, the flow cytometry results. Um, in these graphs, um, non-septic mice that received media are represented in blue. Non-septic mice that received EVs are represented in green. Um, you can see that in each of these um, graphs, these blue and green bars are similar, indicating that treatment of non-septic controls with EVs hasn't really altered the immune response in the absence of sepsis. So they're very, very similar. Giving treatment to controls really did not do anything. And we wanted to see that. We wanted to see whether the treatment would even change um, the controls to see if that had anything uh, to do with, with the findings that we had in septic mice. Uh, red in these graphs represents septic mice treated with media only, and purple represents septic mice treated with the EVs. In graph A, you can see that the total CD11, these are macrophages, were increased in non-treated septic mice, while those treated with EVs trended down, which may represent some um, amelioration of the hyperimmune response induced by sepsis, at least initially. Uh, in graph B, you can see um, the CD11 and CXC3R1. These are, not to complicate things, these, these are interstitial macrophages um, and you know, the, the, the population of those uh, macrophages was decreased by inducing sepsis, but increased following treatment with EVs. So th these macrophages are likely important in addressing the, the continuing infectious insult. 
as we said, we're not with the treatment, we, we are not trying down uh, trying to shut down the immune response. We're trying to bring to bring it back to balance. That's that's the goal of the of the treatment. In graph C, that you can see that endothelial cells were decreased significantly by septic conditions, but increased following treatment with EVs. Given the role of endothelial cells in vascular activity in response to sepsis, this may be important in preventing excessive vascular reactivity. And finally, you can see that CD4 T cells were decreased significantly by sepsis and then increased again by our EVs. So EVs may also help restore the adaptive, adaptive immunity um, under septic conditions. After performing ingenuity pathway analysis on those differentially expressed mRNAs, we saw several immune mediated pathways. We were trying to confirm the results from our flow cytometry. Um, and many of those immune pathways were decreased, likely representing, as we said, a dampening of the hyperimmune response and restoration of immune balance. Um, we also saw a predicted upregulation of IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So there are pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, and um, you know the, the balance is lost again in, in uh, severe infections and sepsis, um, but it seems with the, our treatment, we, we, um, we showed that the, the system is, is again, um, partially balanced. The ERK pathway, which is involved in the regulation of metabolic reprogramming of immune cells, again, metabolism, as we mentioned, um, is, um, is again important here, uh, highlighting um, how immunometabolism um, is involved in severe infection um, and sepsis. So now, how do we approach immunometabolism for the development of treatment? So we understood that it is very important in disease. I, I showed you some of our findings, um, but how do we approach this from a treatment perspective? Um, I found this, this uh, graph pretty interesting. Um, and it's, um, you know, when I first saw it, I, I, it took me a, you know, a little while to understand what it meant, but, um, it, it, this is a graphic representation of, of an immunometabolism equalizer. Um, so just to give you some context, immune system programming begins at the perinatal stage. It matures through environmental stimulation and it's regulated by a balanced network that includes genetic and epigenetic profiles, microbiota, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, sleep, diet, and many, many other elements. Within this network, metabolism either amplifies or inhibits immune function, determining the physiological or altered responses um, by microenvironmental conditions, such as the pH or oxygenation, um, intercellular communication with chemokines, lactate, and TCA intermediates. So those different frequency bands that you see here uh, with an equilibrium position in the center, decreased activity towards the left and increased towards the right. Um, this is actually, it, it, it works as, an, it does work as like an uh, equalization sy um, system. Um, and this pro-anti-inflammatory network selects the immune frequency band that is determined by fine tuning of those elements that make up the expanded system. So all those different elements that are either um, increased towards the right or the left, um, the, this, based on microenvironmental and macroenvironmental factors, those bands are trying to move back to balance, but they're also regulated by those conditions of the environment, but also the internal conditions um, and, you know, you can see differences in those bands when the body needs to have an immune response or a baseline when there's no infection. So those bands change based on conditions and um, it, as the body is actually needs an immune response or doesn't need an immune response, needs a metabolic, you know, um, um, or an energy production or doesn't need, you know, uh, a lot of energy at that time. Um, this equalizer is very, very important because again, as I said, it's also connected to macro environmental elements like microbiota, stress, 
diet, exercise, and medications. And with specific targets, there's an opportunity to modulate this equalizer to bring it back to balance. So we can actually use drugs or other molecules and treatments to bring the system and some of those um, ban uh, bands back to balance um, and and um, help you know the body in different um, conditions, including infections, of course, and sepsis. Back to viral infections now and um, how treatments are, you know, affecting immune metabolism are developed. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about COVID-19. I know, you know, we just recently had a pandemic and we're still, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's considered over now, but we're still dealing with COVID-19 and most likely we'll be dealing for many years to come. So um, COVID-19 um, respiratory infection causes systemic hyperimmune response with a shift from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. Again, same con same concept. Whatever we see in cancer, another bacterial infection, uh, same happens in COVID-19. And many therapies that alter this immuno the um, immunometabolic pathways are currently in clinical trials. Um, the drug Anakinra has been identified as a potential candidate it inhibits the IL-1 um, receptor, and early studies with the drug have been very, very promising. Other treatment approaches target the PPARs or peroxisome proliferator activated receptors. These PPARs are very important because they are at the center of immune metabolism. They regulate both metabolic and immune um, uh, pathways, and um, they help, you know, um, for those who for those pathways to interact. Um, and what else do they do? They directly affect cytokine cascade, inflammatory cell activation, and cellular respiration. Um, newer therapeutic modalities, including anti-mRNA agents. So we talked about um, the um, mRNA that we analyzed. Now there are um, anti-mRNA agents um, that are called antagomeres and antibody cocktails alone or in, or in combination with traditional um, anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids can prevent um, the COVID-19 sequela um, infection um, of COVID-19 infection in patients with metabolic dysregulation. This is actually very important for patients that already have a metabolic um, um, dysfunction, uh, like patients with obesity, diabetes, and so forth. So those patients that um, were infected with COVID-19 and had a lot of complications there is there are promising results out there with some of those uh, drugs that have been developed to target those immunometabolic pathways. Another therapeutic approach is to drive those immune cells through metabolism towards an anti-inflammatory phenotype. Um, and small molecules such, such as DMM, TEP46, rapamycin, 2DG, and DMF, and other molecules um, can promote the uh, development of anti-inflammatory T regulatory cells and um, anti-inflammatory um, macrophages while suppressing differentiation uh, of the more inflammatory um, cells and macrophages, um, which most likely contributes to the um, efficacious um, outcomes when using this in, in models of inflammatory disease. So using specific drugs to drive um, using actually metabolism, those drugs to, to, to change um, the metabolic profiles of cells and drive them towards an anti-inflammatory phenotype has been uh, shown to be very, very uh, promising. Actually, some um, um, the medications that we use for diabetes have shown um, to, um, to have the same effect and are, are used right now in clinical trials. Um, I know Lee will, will, will like this. Um, we talked a lot about how diet can affect uh, immune metabolism in, in disease. And can ketogenic diet be an answer to the immunometabolic dysregulation in acute infection and other conditions? Many studies show its positive effects on blood, lipid, and insulin profile. In this study that I'm presenting here, uh, laboratory analysis of serum samples were performed prior to and after a three-week ketogenic diet. Uh, limiting total carbohydrate intake to less than 30 grams per day, which 
as you know, is very difficult. Um, but it led to significantly reduced serum concentration of insulin and C-peptide, which is important for insulin production. Um, fasting glucose levels remain stable within the physiological range throughout the study. Total blood cholesterol concentrations, as well as levels of LDL, non-HDL, and HDL remained unaltered. Uh, triglycerides were markedly reduced after three weeks of ketogenic diet. Serum urea concentration was elevated under ketogenic diet. I mean, you know, sometimes um, there are, um, you know, this is one of the, the negatives of, of, um, of this diet. Um, and interestingly, those changes were not related to weight loss as correlation analysis revealed no significant association. So we can see how ketogenic diet can have um, some significant effects on metabolism. And here's another study that suggests ketogenic diet as a feasible and effective clinical tool to augment human T cell immunity. Um, three weeks of ketogenic diet markedly improved specific responses of human uh, T lymphocytes in a balanced way, inducing T effector cells and um, T regulatory uh, cells as well, and increase the formation of memory T cells, which is important um, for infection uh, control. This effect was based on a redirection of T cell metabolism towards aerobic um, mitochondrial oxidation, um, resulting in enhanced cellular energy supply, of course, in respiratory reserve. So what the ketogenic diet did is actually induced oxidative phosphorylation, improved energy production, and that led to a more balanced uh, immune um, cell response. So the, the, the immune cell subpopulations were more balanced with the diet. Um, these functional changes were in line with transcriptomic alterations linking the ketogenic diet to a fundamental uh, immunometabolic reprogramming of human T cells. Um, there's a lot of discussion lately about diet as medicine. That's very true in the case of acute infection related immunometabolism. Um, and for the lovers of red wine and resveratrol, um, it is, we're going to talk about it now um, because of this study. And there are many, many more studies about resveratrol out, out there. Um, it affects sirtuin 1, which is an enzyme uh, located primarily in the cell nucleus that um, the acetylates transcription fa uh, factors that contribute to reaction to stressors and longevity. So obesity, for example, which uh, we know leads to metabolic um, dysfunction, is a sirtuin 1 deficient state. So, and it increases morbidity and uh, resource utilization in critically ill patients. So this certain the certain one um, deficiency increases microvascular inflammation and mortality in early sepsis. Resveratrol, what it does actually is, a, is an activator of the certain one and can be found in grapes, berries, peanuts, and red wine, especially in red wine. Um, I know it's also sold over the counter um, um, as a supplement. Um, so it's known for its anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. Um, and in this study, they, they showed that mice with obesity that were pre-treated with resveratrol or vehicle um, before uh, sickle ligation and puncture, uh, which is again, they, they became septic, they, they uh, made them septic. So this group that was treated pre-treated with resveratrol had significantly increased seven day survival compared to um, the, uh, the septic mice that received um, the vehicle. And this is one of the many studies that uh, is discussing how certain one um, activity can be targeted to treat chronic and acute inflammatory diseases and the role of resveratrol and other naturally occurring highly powerful antioxidants as therapeutic agents. So diet as medicine, there are a lot of applications and a lot of things that we could um, do um, if we if we approach treatments that way. Um, some take home messages from this presentation. There is, there is a metabolic reprogramming of immune cells in response to infection and autoimmune inflammation. Diet and other environmental factors play a significant role, of course. Um, we showed that mesenchymal stem cell derived 
extracellular vesicles may mitigate some of um, the damage that happens in um, the central nervous system and the lungs. And targeting immunometabolism as an anti-inflammatory strategy presents an opportunity to decrease mortality and improve clinical outcomes in many, many conditions, including severe infections, autoimmune diseases, and even cancer. So there are a lot of approaches that we can take using immunometabolism uh, to target some of those very serious uh, conditions that have high mortality and um, need to be tackled um, as, um, as, as, public health, um, um, as a public health issue. Um, I want to thank all my collaborators, lab technicians and scientists that contributed to this work. Um, and I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to go, um, I'm, I'm not going to open this up to uh, questions. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And we already have one very good question in the chat. Uh, interesting experimental results in your animal model with EVs. Mice have a lot of HDL. Do you separate EVs from HDL particles that, unlike LDL and VLDL, share density properties with EVs? Maybe relevant, give the functional role of HDL in innate immunity and sepsis. Interestingly, polyphenolic CERT1 and PPAR is also known to improve HDL function. Very, it was very a lot. Thank you. No, no, that, that's, that's great, actually. So um, these are adipose tissue. Um, we don't, um, we, we don't separate the EVs from HDL particles. Um, that is a very um, good, good question, good thought. Um, we separate them from uh, adipose tissue. And I understand that they, um, they, they do have some density properties with EVs. Um, the technology is very difficult or, 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 or not there yet to be able to make such differentiations. Uh, we're working on it. I'm working with it, um, the, the, a new TFF technology um, for EV uh, differentiation and um, isolation. So hopefully we'll have even more accurate EVs. So right now, um, and this is one of the major problems why we haven't moved yet to clinical trials, is because we can't standard, uh, standardize the process of isolating and making sure that all EVs we're isolating will have the same cargo, will have the same exact effects. And part of the problem is the techniques we have for isolation are not perfect right now. So more to come on that. Um, hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to um, be able to have a better differentiation. Thank you. We are short on time. Brett, do you have a question you'd like to ask or go ahead? I, I definitely do. It looks great like talk. you did. Yeah, it was, it was a very, very great talk. Um, I think the results from your septic mouse model is very promising with the EVs from the mesenchymal um, cells. The question I have related to that, um, is there any data to suggest those would be just as efficient or whether they their efficiency would change if they are now going to be transferred into a mouse that has some other metabolic phenotype? Would they work just as efficiently in a diabetic mouse as they do in the lean, healthy mice? Well, healthy being charged with a septic challenge. Right. Very good question. We haven't done any experiments using um, mice with obesity or um, any other metabolic dysfunction. In studies, though, that they, there are studies out there um, that that EVs have been used um, in, um, in in obesity, and they've had similar results. Not in sepsis, in other conditions. We haven't done this work. It, it's a very good idea for us to work on that because. Um, as I mentioned, even with COVID-19, one of the major issue was that um, the, the most serious um, 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 complications were in patients with obesity, diabetes, and other um, metabolic issues. So having a treatment that will also help um, the, the, those patients would be ideal. And it's something that we will definitely look into. Well, we look forward to hearing about that research. That sounds fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and for kicking off our seminar series for this year. Uh, we hope you'll come back and uh, ask some questions of our future speakers. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.